uh, uh, contacted um, Fisher House in Washington, and uh, they're going to be sending me uh, information on how we can help uh, with you at the Fisher House in Washington. Uh, and uh, so we'll be uh, talking about those in executive board meetings and then bringing the, the things that we talk about to you so that you are a part of the decision of what we do. We don't uh, want to be uh, an executive board that doesn't put things before you, and we all make the choices, and we do what is best for the majority of us uh, as we go. So we'll be doing those things, and it's extremely important. Next we have with us, and she's going to be here for just a bit, uh, Joe Ray Perkins is running for uh, U.S. Senate uh, in District 4, and she's going to come up and say oh. why. men and women are willing to lay their lives down the line to protect our freedom, our liberties, our rights. We've got elected officials that are voting away those freedoms, those liberties, and those rights. And that's wrong. And we've got to stop it. We all know that, that, that the approval rating in Congress is horrible. Why then is the re-election of an incumbent over 90%? The answer is because it's not your representative or your senator, it's everybody else's. So when people go to the ballot box, they go, oh, well, DeFazio is doing a good job. What, look what he's done for the veterans. Well, my question is why is he still having to do the same thing over and over and over again for the veterans? So they go to him, I've got this problem. I've got problem A. So he takes care of problem A. Well, veteran number two comes along and says, so I've got a problem with problem A. Well, he takes care of problem A. But he never enacts that solution firmly. Why? Because if he did, you don't need him. And that's the mentality of career politicians. Let's see, you go to the ballot box, and you, you, know, you wouldn't, but this is what people do. They would vote for DeFazio because he's done a good job. But doggone it, that Schrader does a horrible job. Well, you aren't in District 5. You can't vote Schrader out. And that's why so many people get reelected because they think their guy is good and everybody else is bad, or, or their lady is good and everybody else is bad. We've got to start getting that message out there. People, you can't vote out for somebody who you can't vote for. It's that simple. And that's why reelection rate is so high. It was Einstein who said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. Well, how long are we going to continue to elect career politicians who are not reading the bills, who are going against their value system, who are compromising away what they really believe in, so that they go along to get along, so that they can continue on in their careers? And if 
we take a look at what the founders had in, in mind. Did they put in place a two-year term for, for House, four for the President, and six for the Senate? In their mind, that was a term limit. They didn't expect people to be there forever and ever and ever and ever <laughs> until they <laughs> in there who gets it. My background, for those of you that don't know, my background is in financial planning and budgeting. I, before I closed my business, was sitting down with people, showing them how to get out of debt. Um, in two hours, I could sit down. I actually did marriage counseling in a two-hour time frame because they said, look, here's the deal. You can't go back and undo anything that you did. <laughs> so you can't blame each other. It's that simple. You both have to acknowledge that you're both responsible for how you got to where you are. You've got to make an agreement that you're going to go forward and you're going to work on this and you're going to stop, stop those habits. And, and, I, and people walked out with an absolute roadmap of how to get out of debt. Uh, so that was part of my background. But the more important part of my background of being a financial advisor is with my licenses, I have a legal, which is called a fiduciary responsibility, a legal responsibility to prudently care for my client's money because it wasn't my money. So I couldn't make recommendations that were of high risk. If they were my life, I was first licensed in 1986. I take that exact same kind of mentality and opinion with me to Washington, D.C. In fact, I've done the same thing with um, the money that has been donated to my campaign. I searched and searched and searched to get a really good deal on my business cards. Those whole colored business cards, a thousand of them cost me less than $20. My brochure, a thousand of those cost me about $150. Huh? Nobody, no other candidate has been able to find those deals. But see, it's not my money. Well, there's some of it's my money, or my husband's money, because he's working and I'm not, um, except for this. Uh, but, but I take that same kind of attitude and say, look, if I can do this and I can look for good deals, because it's not my money, it's people that believe in me. Well, when you pay your taxes, that's not the government's money, it's still your money. We're supposed to be a republic of the people, by the people, for the people. We should be telling the government what to do. Folks, we have over one trillion dollars of debt. That means if I gave you a million dollars every day to spend, it would take you over 2,000 years to spend one trillion dollars. I'm sorry, over 17 trillion dollars of debt. The government's spending over a trillion dollars a year more than they're bringing in. Because they've got an unlimited credit card. How are we going to take care of that unlimited credit card? We've got to get a balanced budget amendment passed, a constitutional amendment. That balanced budget amendment came up many, many years ago. Senator Mark Hatfield voted no. Had Senator Mark Hatfield of Oregon voted yes, we would have a balanced budget in the Constitution today. Our own senator. Wouldn't it be justice to have another Oregon senator go to Washington, D.C., get a balanced budget amendment proposed and passed? I just think that that would be an absolutely wonderful thing. Um, so I come in with 30 plus years of life experience. I'm 57 years old. I am the only candidate of those of us in a file. Folks, I'm 100% all in. I gave up all of my licenses. And it took years, a lot of training, a lot of studying to get my investment licenses. And I gave them up in December of 2012 because I knew that I was going to be in this election. Just like our founders, they <coughs> laid it all on the line. They were willing to lay it down. And I'm the only one that has said, you know what? Even though it's going to be a huge financial strain on us, and it is. My husband is a carpet installer. If he's not out there laying carpet, he's not bringing in money. And this has been the worst January that he's had in four years. And it's tight. But God is good. And there's always at least enough for us to at least pay our bills every month. I'm not wealthy. I'm a Main Street American. That's who I am. And isn't that what we need? And isn't that what our founders had in mind? Is let's have people that are involved in their communities. If you go online to my website, PerkinsForUSSenate.com, look at my bio. It's huge. I have, if you've never written down all the things you've been involved in, do it. 
I had so much fun as I was sitting down writing out everything that I'd ever done. I even put on there that I was the league secretary for bowling. Uh, you know, just because, but I, and I forgot to put down what I did for the kids' junior leagues. But, uh, but it's, it's fun. But I did exactly what our founders said. Be involved in your communities. Take care of your families. And then if you feel it's the right thing, go serve your country for a limited period of time. Return back home to your families, to your communities. Our kids are grown. We're empty nesters. So not only have I walked away from my career, I don't have to worry about leaving my kids at home and their dad taking care of them, which to me is the ideal situation because when I need to be somewhere, I can be there. I think it's time that we get somebody in Washington, D.C. that gets it, that understands what the majority of Americans go through day in and day out, that understands that what Obamacare, the Abominable Care Act, <laughs> what it's really doing to families. So that increase in premiums, whether you're a senior or not a senior, your premiums are going up, takes money out of your disposable income. So for many people that are already living on a relatively tight budget, that's less disposable income that they can have. So they can't go out and eat as often. When they can't go out and eat as often, the restaurants have to cut back their staff. And when the restaurants cut back their staff, their staff doesn't have as much money to go out there and buy widgets at the widget store. Then the widget maker has to start laying off their widget makers. And then they're not out there <coughs> buying a car. Since <coughs> in this recession, and what ends up happening is going to we become dependent upon the government for our food and our phones and energy assistance, and medical care. And isn't that exactly what the socialist agenda is? Now, let me give you the good news. Here's the good news, because I gave you all the bad news. The founding of our country, roughly 20 to 30% of the citizens were loyal to the crown. They were happy being underneath the monarchy. That is today's liberals. Roughly 20 to 30% were the patriots. They did not like that centralized government. You folks represent that patriot spirit. That's who you are. Because you don't believe that the government should be running your lives and taking care of everything for you. The government has its place, but they've overstretched their, their authority. Roughly 40 to 60 percent of the population then and today don't get it. They don't think it affects them. I talk to people, well, I'm not involved in politics, well, yes, you are. They don't realize what the government does. But here's, like I said, the good news. What happened in the Revolutionary War? Who won? Patriots. And if we get more people, and we keep talking, we say, look, we've got to get somebody in there who gets it, who lives it, who's been there, who's smart, who's got education, who knows what they're doing, we can save our republic. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that I'm that person, and I'm not going to take any garbage. I'll close with this, my promise. And I know every politician, and I'm not a politician, I'm a stateswoman, there's a difference, but every candidate, so I'll put it that way, gives you promises. And here's my promise, and I know I can keep it, because it's very simple. Number one, is the overarching promise. Every bill will be read by myself and or my staff, and most likely I will be reading those bills because I don't want to vote on something I haven't read. What a concept. And if we're given a bill, there's not a chance that we're going to even be able to read the first page of it. It's going to be an automatic no vote because I'm not going to vote for something I can't read. I've got to know what's in it. This idea of Pelosi, you've got to pass it to know what's in it. It's a bunch of garbage. Nobody in this room would buy a house or a car without reading the fine print and making sure that they didn't have something slipped in. But in that promise to know how we're going to vote on that bill, every bill must be congruent with the Constitution of the United States of America and the Bill of Rights and the amendments, and specifically as our founders intended, not as interpreted and changed by judicial activism. Number two, 
Those bills must be free if pork barrel spending and unrelated projects. That's how we ended up in over $17 trillion of current debt and $124 trillion of future unfunded liabilities is by adding on all these promises that we can't afford. Final part of my promise, that bill has to pass, it's got to be fiscally conservative. And it has to be socially conservative. I'm a social conservative and I will not make any apology for it because that's who God made me to be. And that's who I am and that's who I choose to be. But we've got to stop the madness. And we've got to get somebody up there who, just like John Adams says, I'd rather be right than stand with the majority. My name is Joe Ray Perkins. I ask for three things. Number one, your prayers. That's most important to me, is to have people that are praying for, for me. It gets tough out there, and I, but I'm having a good time. Even when I'm having a rough day, I have a good time anyway, because I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Number two, I need support. Financial support is huge. I'm up against a couple of candidates that got deep, deep, deep pockets. Like I said, we're living on one income. Five dollars goes a long way. I've already explained, you know, I'm giving you a couple of examples of how to stretch the money. Um, and the other way of support is telling people about me. It's great. Have a meet and greet. Have me over for coffee. Invite a few friends. Let me talk with them. I will answer any question on any topic that anybody wants to know. And the third thing, May 20th, your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Several uh, opportunities to be with uh, Joe Ray and Dennis Richardson. And I tell you, the, the event that we had with the college Republicans uh, last week was wonderful. And uh, all, all, everybody that spoke really did well. And uh, I enjoyed the gentleman. I Cowboy. <laughs> oh, John, John Jefferson. John Jefferson. He was, I mean, he was a hoot. He, he was down to earth all the time. But uh, what, a, what a joy uh, to listen to these people. And um, I know we can't uh, support any one person right now, but I know my choice is. Because I've been at him for five years, or I forgot. <laughs> and he's doing it now. And, uh, but, uh, all of them um, did a really good job. Um, they just are really uh, outstanding people. And what a joy. I'm blushing. I have no emotions. What a joy to be in a group of people where we have the right to praise our Father. I am so glad to be a part of this group. And we're going to have a